Today on Alex Nautos, we're out here taking a look at the 2015 Lexus RX 450h Hybrid. Now the RX was really the first luxury crossover and it was also the first luxury crossover hybrid. Now the crossover initially was intended to be a fuel efficient alternative to those body on frame SUVs that everyone else had in the market. Of course, the RX 450h takes things to the next level with the gasoline electric hybrid drivetrain to give you either 29 or 30 miles per gallon average. Up front, we have the latest Lexus spindle grille adapted to the Lexus RX. Now I say adapted because this is the third generation of the Lexus RX, but it has been refreshed once. And the refresh really just brought this Lexus spindle grille to the exterior and a few other tweaks on the inside and the outside. Now I think for the Lexus RX, the most attractive look is in the Lexus RX 350F Sport. The second most attractive is the Lexus RX 350 with the F Sport appearance package. And that is a slightly different grill than you find in the 350 F Sport itself. And I think that the hybrid model is not quite as attractive as some of those others. Some of that is aerodynamics. The F Sport model has a slightly longer chin. It's a little bit deeper down here, whereas this cuts in a little bit sooner to give you a more aerodynamic front end. We also have a different grill going on in that F Sport. It's the F Sport squiggly grill rather than this slotted grill that we get right here on the hybrid model. There are three different headlamp options to choose from. Base models get halogen headlamps. We have the HID headlamps in our particular model. You can also option up full LED headlamps. Now the model we're taking a look at here has all three kinds of beams integrated into this front end. We have standard halogen high beams, HID low beams, and we have LED fog lamps. Now when you compare the RX to the competition, it's important to keep in mind the size of the Lexus RX. Because the RX is about a half a step larger than your average compact European luxury crossover. So something like the Audi Q5, the Volvo XC60, the Mercedes-Benz GLK, and the BMW X3 will be smaller than this vehicle. And that's actually why Lexus has recently launched the Lexus NX crossover. Now you can find a first take review of that Lexus NX on my channel and expect a complete review on one sometime in December. Now the big difference between those other luxury crossovers and the Lexus RX is mostly right back here in the back seat. We get a much wider back seat. We also get more headroom back here and more headroom right up front than you do in your average rear wheel drive crossover especially. Now the RX is a two row crossover, so that means it doesn't necessarily compete with the likes of the Acura MDX either because that MDX is a larger three row crossover. The RX has long had a very distinctive style and that continues for this latest model. We have these tail lamps that stick out a little bit from the body right back here. That's something that Toyota and Lexus have been doing lately. We also have a spoiler right up here at the very top of the hatchback. We have a simple chrome strip right down here, well integrated parking sensors, and we have a hidden exhaust tip on the RX 450H. All versions of the RX use a 3.5 liter V6. If you get the base RX 350 or the RX 350F Sport, that V6 will produce 270 horsepower and 248 pound-feet of torque. Now the RX 350 sends that power to the front wheels only by default via a six-speed automatic transaxle. If you get the optional all-wheel drive system, then it can send up to 50% of the power to the rear without any wheel slip. If the front wheels are both slipping, it can send up to 100% of the power to the rear or just about. If you get the RX 350F Sport, you don't get any additional power, but you do get an eight-speed automatic transmission and standard all-wheel drive that will drop your zero to 60 time by about half a second. Now the RX 450H Hybrid also uses a 3.5 liter V6 engine, except that it's running on an Atkinson cycle, and that actually drops the horsepower and torque figures down to 245 horsepower and 234 pound-feet of torque for just the engine alone. Now that engine is mated to the Lexus hybrid drive system, which is very different than those other hybrid systems out on the market, especially from those other luxury players. Now this hybrid system uses two motor generator units, the larger of which produces 155 horsepower by itself, to give you a combined total of 295 horsepower and approximately 300 pound-feet of torque. Now you can also get an optional all-wheel drive system in this 450H, which is what we're taking a look at right here, and that does not use a mechanical all-wheel drive system. Instead, it adds an additional motor in the back of the vehicle, good for 67 horsepower. That means that this vehicle produces 295 horsepower total, but only 67 horsepower can go to the rear wheels. That's very different than the mechanical system that's used in the 350 or the 350F Sport. Now, I've had a lot of questions about hybrid system reliability. Now, in general, the Ford, Toyota, and Lexus hybrid systems are very reliable because they're very simple in truth. This vehicle only uses one planetary gear set, two motors, and an engine. There is no reverse gear in this vehicle. There are no multiple clutch packs, etc., like you'll find in a traditional automatic transmission. We also don't have any belts or pulleys like you'll find in a traditional CVT. Now, thanks to that simple and elegant system, we have incredibly high fuel economy for a vehicle that weighs about 4,500 pounds or so. Fuel economy 
for the front-wheel drive hybrid comes in at 32 miles per gallon city, 28 highway, and 30 combined. Now, if you add that optional all-wheel drive system, the numbers just drop down to 30 miles per gallon city, 28 highway, and 29 combined. The reason there's not much of a reduction in the highway fuel economy is because there's no mechanical link between the rear axle and the front axle, and that really improves fuel economy out on the highway. That compares very favorably with the base model, which comes in at 18 miles per gallon city, 25 highway, and 21 combined. All-wheel drive model of that comes in at 18, 24, 20. And if you get the F Sport, we actually get a slight bump on the highway economy thanks to that eight-speed automatic transmission. And that comes in at 18, 26, 21, even though that is all-wheel drive only in the F Sport. Now, thanks to those very high fuel economy numbers, especially if you do a lot of city driving, the RX 450H is one of the few hybrids out there that has a reasonable payback time. When it comes to towing, the regular RX 350 can tow 3,500 pounds when properly equipped. The RX 450H in front-wheel drive trim is not intended for towing at all, according to Lexus, but if you do get the all-wheel drive version, then you can tow 3,500 pounds when properly equipped. Front seat comfort comes in at 8 out of 10 points, but it will depend a little bit on your body shape. If you're a larger person, especially a taller person, you'll probably find the RX more comfortable especially than those European crossovers with which it competes on the low end. Now versus something larger than this like a BMW X5 or a Mercedes ML, those will be more comfortable up front. Now our particular model has the 10-way power adjustable driver's seat with the two-way adjustable manual headrest right there. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column that is memory linked with the three position memory right over there on the door. As part of one of the optional packages, you can get an optional extending thigh cushion for both front seats and that is also memory linked as well. Now personally, I didn't think that that package added much comfort for me, but again, taller drivers might find that more comfortable because it will make the seat bottom cushion a little bit longer. Rear seat comfort easily comes in at 10 out of 10 points. The RX is a very large two row crossover. That means we get a considerable and generous amount of space right here behind the front seats. This front seat's adjusted for me at six feet tall. You can see I have about six inches of leg room left right there. Now, because all RX models are based on a front wheel drive design and the RX 450H does not have a mechanical connection between the front axle and the rear axle, we have absolutely no hump right here in the middle seat. That means that the middle seat is still very comfortable. My hair is barely brushing the ceiling, but this is considerably higher than these outboard bucket style seats. Moving over to the right side, this front seat was adjusted for a six foot five passenger I had in the car. I have about two and a half inches of legroom left right here and still a generous amount of headroom in the outboard seats. Keep in mind that we are in the sunroof equip model and that does reduce your headroom just a little bit. Aiding in rear passenger comfort, we have rear seats that also slide forward and backward that gives you a little bit more room in the back for cargo. And we also have a reclining seat mechanism that does get fairly reclined right here. And the only thing I disliked about this rear passenger compartment is the center armrest. It is shaped a little bit unusually. It kind of slopes downwards a little bit towards the front. We have two very large cup holders in this section. This is hard touch plastic right at front, but we have a padded leather armrest right here in the middle with a storage cubby right in there. Now, one very convenient feature with the RX is that we do have a 40, 20, 40 folding rear seat back. So we can fold this 20 section down separately from the outboard section and put long items right into the vehicle. Let's do our usual walk around the interior now. We have height adjustable headrests for the driver and the front passenger. We also have height adjustable seat belts right over there for the two people up front. Now, several people have asked me to show you what the sunroof option looks like in the vehicle. You can see that right here. This is the only one available in the Lexus RX, so we do not have a panoramic roof that would go all the way to the rear. Now, the front door is comprised mostly of soft touch plastics where you can touch. So we have a soft touch middle section right here, soft touch upper, soft touch armrest as well. Now, our particular model has the optional bamboo wood trim that you can see right here. We'll take a better look at that in just a little bit. We also have hard plastics lower in the door as well as in that uh, little cubby right there that is a water bottle holder below the armrest. Now, you'll notice that we also have a separate tweeter and mid-range right over here on the left. Now, zooming out for a moment, you'll notice this dashboard design is different than what you'll see in the most modern of Lexus's product line. That's because we have this center screen set way back in the dashboard, and we also have this large center hump for that screen set in there. This isn't quite the same theme that you'll see in the current generation Lexus GS or Lexus IS. Moving over to the passenger side, you can see that right below this airbag, we do have a large glove compartment. This is a removable divider, so you can remove it to put larger items in there. I was able to easily fit a tablet computer right inside. Instead of wood trim on this side, we have a faux metallic strip that runs across the dashboard right there, separating the glove box from the upper portion of the dashboard. This is all soft touch plastic. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, we have our large Lexus N-Form screen. If you want to know more about the Lexus N-Form infotainment and navigation system, go ahead and click that link at the bottom of your screen. You'll be taken on over to that review that is separate from this car review. 
Below the infotainment screen, we have two large air vents. We also have the single slot optical disc player, physical buttons for power, volume, tune and scroll right over there, play, pause and an eject button right over there. We also have direct access buttons to radio, media and our preset and track forward backward buttons. Now our particular model also has the optional Mark Levinson premium sound system. Now below that you'll also see the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control system. You can see these readouts also in the Lexus Enform display right over there. We have a very traditional shifter, but rather than being in the console, it's actually kind of in the dashboard right there that helps free up space lower in the console. That additional real estate in the center console mostly goes to this Lexus remote touch controller. It is sort of a joystick-like arrangement. You wiggle this little trackpad around and a little cursor moves around on the screen. Again, if you want to know more about that, then take a look at the Lexus Enform video that's separate from this. We have a dedicated menu button, zoom in, out, up, down button, and a map voice button right over there. This is just an armrest right back here. Now to the right of that, underneath this bamboo cover, we have two very large cup holders that were easily able to accommodate the largest takeout sodas that I was able to throw at it. Below the Lexus remote touch controller, we have our EV mode button right here that allows you to operate in EV mode only below certain speeds as long as you're gentle on the throttle. We also have our traction control off button right here. Now if we slide this center console lid back, you will see the controls for our heated and cooled seats. The cooled seats are an option in the RX350 hybrid. We also have a little change holder right over here. Now behind those, if we open up the center console, you'll find a very large and very deep center console for a luxury crossover vehicle. That's because this is primarily a front wheel drive vehicle. So you can see this is very deep and I have all manner of random things going on right there inside the center console. Now this is also where you'll find the USB and the stereo mini auxiliary input. Now in a style queue that's becoming all the rage, we have a slightly floating center console right here. So we do have a storage cubby right there underneath that. We also have a 12 volt power outlet right in there. Now, size-wise, I wasn't able to fit a gallon of milk in there, so that should give you some idea of how big that area is. Now, moving over to the driver's side, we have what looks like a very typical four-dial instrument cluster, but you'll notice something very different over here. We don't have a tachometer on this side. Instead, we have a charge, eco, and power gauge right over there. This tells you how much energy you're using combined from the battery or from the engine graphically right over here rather than a tachometer. Since you can't control the engine directly in Toyota or Lexus's hybrids, then there's really no point in having a tachometer. So that's why we have this dial right over there instead. Now housed right inside this sort of pilsner shaped area in the center between those two gauges we have our multi-information display right up top, transmission indicator right there, and then we have our odometer and trip odometer right there below it. Now if you're driving efficiently, this portion of this instrument cluster right up here will actually glow blue. It's on either side of that pilsner shape. Control of that multi-information display is handled right here on the steering wheel with this three-way control, up, down, and enter. Now on that multi-information display, we have our usual power gauge, which tells you where the power is coming from and where it's going to. We also have our current MPG, after refueling MPG, and average MPG that can be reset at any time, average speed, cruising range, and tire pressure. So a blank section right there if you don't want to be disturbed by any information. And then we cycle on back to that hybrid gauge. Now if we zoom out to the steering wheel, you notice another button right down here below the controls for that multi-information screen that allows you to change certain vehicle settings using that same screen right over there. We also have our dedicated phone hang up and pick up buttons right over here, voice command button. On this side, we have our volume up, down, track up, down, and mode button. You'll find the cruise control buttons right here on the stock that rotates with the steering wheel. Speaking of steering wheels, this is the optional partial bamboo steering wheel. It's a very attractive three-spoke design. It's also very chunky, which is nice and comfortable for long driving trips. Now over to the left of the steering wheel, we have an additional cup holder positioned right here below this air vent. I was still able to fit a large takeout drink right in that cup holder, although it does block that air vent from you. We're now zoomed in on this optional bamboo trim on the driver's door so you can really see what that looks like. I really find it one of the more attractive and interesting wood choices available in a modern luxury car. Now one of the big reasons to buy the RX over the competition is certainly cargo capacity because we have an extraordinarily large cargo area right back here. This is much larger thanks to the overall size of the RX than you'll find in any of those European competitors especially. Now if I take these bags out of the trunk, and lift up the load floor, you'll also find something a little bit unusual for modern hybrids, and that is we actually have a spare tire right here under the cargo load floor. And that's because the hybrid battery pack in the RX is almost entirely under the second row seats, so it doesn't really eat up any cargo area right back here. When it comes to my exclusive trunk comfort index, the RX easily scores 10 out of 10 points. This is definitely one of the largest cargo areas you can get in this category. 
It's also finished very nicely, and there's some additional practical touches which I really like. The biggest of those practical features is the ability to fold these seats flat from either inside the vehicle or from right back here in the cargo area. There's a lever both in the back and right there on the side, so you can do that either back here or up there. You don't have to walk around if you have large cargo in your hands. We're out on regular city streets in the RX450H because this truly is the natural habitat for the modern hybrid. And that's largely because modern hybrids tend to give us much larger city EPA ratings than highway EPA ratings. The reason for that is because this vehicle can shut the engine off when it needs to, especially when we're going low speeds like we are right now. So we're decelerating, we're going down below 40 miles an hour or so right here, the vehicle has already turned its engine off. Now if I need to creep up in this traffic right here, the vehicle doesn't need to turn its engine on either for that. Now it should be obvious from the horsepower figures from this electric motor that the motor is not the limitation for driving in EV mode, it's actually the battery pack. That means that the engine is of course running when we're driving at a constant speed on the highway like we are right here. We're going 65 miles an hour and we're getting fairly good fuel economy at the moment. That's because this Atkinson cycle engine is very, very efficient and the way this hybrid drivetrain operates, it can keep the engine at a very specific and very efficient RPM as much as possible. Now the power from the engine is flowing to the wheels both mechanically and electrically. And that's important to keep in mind because this is different than something like a BMW i3 which can never have a mechanical connection between the engine and the wheels. That makes us very efficient at highway speeds as well. Going a little bit out of order, let's talk about fuel economy first, since this is a hybrid. I've been averaging between 27 and a half and 30 miles per gallon in very mixed driving in this vehicle. That includes photo shoots and going up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass. You can thank the battery and the ability to regenerate the electricity into the battery for that. Because my commute has sections of stop and go traffic on it, that actually raises my fuel economy numbers in this vehicle, whereas it lowers gasoline only vehicles fuel economy numbers. Now, of course, your fuel economy will vary based on your commute. If you have a very highway heavy commute, then you may find that you'll get better fuel economy in a small diesel engine vehicle, something along the lines of a GLK 250. However, if your commute is mixed or you have a lot of in-city driving or a lot of stop and go traffic, then this will probably give you the best fuel economy. Cabin noise out on the highway comes in at nine out of 10 points. I scored 69 decibels at 50 miles an hour, which is a very good score for this segment. Now, Lexus has long been known for smooth rides and that's no different in the RX 450 hybrid. The ride is not exactly pillow soft, but it is very compliant. And overall, I give this nine out of 10 points. The suspension in the RX is very well tuned. It never felt out of sorts around corners, even on broken pavement. You will get a slightly more compliant ride in something along the lines of a Mercedes-Benz ML, depending on the configuration, but this is one of the smoothest. When it comes to acceleration, I ran from zero to 60 in 6.1 seconds, which is very good for a hybrid vehicle. This is also faster than the gasoline only version of the RX 350 by about a full second. It's a little bit faster also than the RX 350 F Sport, which does get an eight speed automatic transmission. Now, when you take a look at the numbers, you might wonder how that performance improvement over the gasoline version is possible, since this doesn't necessarily produce that much more power than the gasoline version. The reason is down to the electric motors. They produce approximately 300 pound-feet of torque when combined with the gasoline engine. Again, Lexus won't release figures on that in a detailed manner either, but by my estimates, it's around 300 pound-feet of torque or so. And all that torque is delivered at a much lower RPM than the gasoline engine with that six-speed automatic. We also get a transmission that behaves very much like a CVT, so it can keep the engine in its optimum power band as long as possible, giving you that best acceleration. When it comes to braking, I'll give this seven out of 10 points. It's important to keep in mind that the RX is a half step larger than the compact entries in this segment. So obviously it's not going to brake quite as well as those lighter entries. Now that said, even at 4,500 pounds, the RX scores very well in terms of fade resistance. That's largely down to the hybrid drivetrain system because the hybrid system tries to regenerate as much power into the battery as possible. That's providing a decent amount of your braking effort, giving your brakes a little bit of a rest, even on long downhill slopes. Now, while we're talking about braking, an interesting twist with the all-wheel drive system is that because it's using a separate electric motor back there, it also gets involved in the regenerative braking. It makes the car feel a little bit more sure-footed, even in light braking applications, if you're on a loose surface. Now, there is a price to be paid for all this fuel economy, and that is handling in the RX. Handling comes in around six out of 10 points. Handling has never really been the RX's forte, but the hybrid is definitely a little bit softer and a little bit less grippy than the other flavors of the RX. Some of that is down to the weight and some of that is also down to the tire choices. Now that's not to say that the RX is sloppy. This definitely feels connected to the driver out on the road. The steering is obviously numb, but then so is pretty much every other luxury vehicle these days thanks to electric power steering. Now the biggest difference is in the grip. There's a lot less grip going on in the RX hybrid. Now of course Lexus's own NX hybrid, which is their smaller hybrid crossover vehicle that we should see in December, does get much better handling ratings than this vehicle out on the road. 
If you're contemplating buying the all-wheel drive version of the RX450, there's something that you really ought to know about the all-wheel drive system. This is an electric all-wheel drive system, so the power going to the rear axle is provided by a separate electric motor than what's going on under the hood. That means that the power to the rear axle is limited to just under 70 horsepower. That's significantly less than you'll find in the gasoline-only RX350, because the gasoline-only RX350, even if there's no wheel slip going on, can put 50% of its power to the rear axle. That's about 135 horsepower or so. Now the other hybrids in this segment can direct more power to their rear axle as well, and that's because they all use mechanical all-wheel drive systems. So the Infiniti as well as the Audi hybrid crossover vehicles do use a mechanical system that can send 50% of the power to the rear when no slip is occurring at any wheel, and they can direct up to 100% of the power to the rear wheels if there is slip all across the front axle. So in that Infiniti hybrid, if both front wheels are slipping, it can send 100% of the power to the rear. Now when you select that $1,400 all-wheel drive option in the RX450, they don't just insert an electric motor in the rear. There are a few changes going on under the hood as well. Basically what happens is the motor generator unit that's attached to the engine in this vehicle generates the power and then that is sent to the motor generator unit in the rear. Because that motor generator unit in the rear can actually pull more power than the battery can provide. So it's not possible to max that sucker out with just the battery involved. Now the reason for that is again down to the battery size. The battery can only put out approximately 25 horsepower in this vehicle. That's how you get from the 270 horsepower that the engine produces alone to the 295 total system horsepower. Now what that really means to you is that if you floor the vehicle, it will try and put 67 horsepower to the rear. Now 25 of that 67 horsepower will be coming from the battery pack, and the rest will actually be coming from the engine. It just won't be shuttled here mechanically, it'll actually be sent back there electrically. So the engine will be spinning at its maximum, it'll be generating electricity via the motor generator units under the hood right there, and that will actually be sending additional electricity to the back to give you 67 total horsepower in the back. Now it will also deliver 67 horsepower if you're trying to get yourself unstuck stuck from something. So if the vehicle senses wheel slip, it will try and direct more power to the rear. Now I have had this generation of Lexus's hybrid all-wheel drive system in the snow. The big thing to keep in mind is that it may not feel quite as sure-footed or quite as confident, but it will still get you out of those sticky situations, unless your situation is really dire, in which case you may have troubles getting out of it with any vehicle. So bottom line in the drive section is it really depends on what you're after. If you're looking for the best fuel economy, the softest ride, the most comfy seats, and the quietest cabin, then the RX is going to score incredibly high. If you're also looking for the lowest cost to own, then the RX is definitely at the top of the list. But if you're looking for the most sporting drive, then this probably isn't the vehicle for you. Now interestingly enough, if you're looking for a sportier hybrid, you do want to look inside the Lexus stable. That new Lexus NX 300H hybrid is a very dynamic vehicle. I did have a brief chance to test that out in British Columbia earlier this year, and I was really surprised by its abilities out on the road. Now of course that NX hybrid isn't going to be as fast from 0 to 60 as the RX because it does have less power under the hood, but it's also lighter. It's definitely more nimble out on the road, it feels an awful lot more connected, and it definitely feels more engaging overall. Now on the surface of things, an 8 mile per gallon jump from 20 to 28 miles per gallon on average may sound insignificant, but it's truly not. It will actually save the average driver about $2,000 a year in terms of gas cost. Now that's the important thing to keep in mind when you're taking a look at fuel economy numbers out there and you're cross-shopping vehicles. If the average fuel economy numbers are small, then small variations actually affect your pocketbook more than large variations with much more fuel efficient vehicles. So for instance, jumping from 40 to 50 miles per gallon won't save you nearly as much money as jumping from 20 to 28 miles per gallon on average. Pricing is fairly simple for the 2015 model year. The RX 350, that's the base gasoline only model, starts at $40,970. If you want the RX 450H, that will set you back $47,620. Now, if you want to add all-wheel drive, that will cost you $1,400 on the 450H. The model we're taking a look at right here rang in at $57,405, and if you load up your RX 450H all-wheel drive all the way, you will end up at $62,848. Before we move straight into comparisons, let's talk options. First on my list is the $4,000 rear seat entertainment system. It does look very good, especially in photos, but it's $4,000 and I don't think that's really an option that I would get. Then we have the $2,260 premium package that does give you perforated leather. We also get the sunroof and a few other options. For $2,260, that is an option that I would select. We then have the $825 comfort package that gives you the heated and cooled seats as well as rain sensing wipers and HID headlamps. Now I would get that package over the LED headlamp option standalone because the LED headlamps are fairly expensive. You also don't get the heated cooled seats and the rain sense wipers with that bundled package. The luxury package at $4,950 is easily the most expensive option 
option package on the RX, you get the extending thigh cushions on the front seats, and you get the upgraded leather interior. That's not an option that I would pick if it were me. I would, however, also get the radar cruise control for $1,500, but I would skip the heads-up display for $1,200. The hybrid model is about $6,000 more expensive than the non-hybrid model. I know that sounds like an awful lot, but when you actually take a look at the fuel economy savings in something like a crossover that's big and heavy as the RX is, Hybrids actually make more sense than your average midsize sedan or your average compact vehicle because this hybrid will actually save you $1,650 per year over that gasoline RX350. Now in addition to that, we also get more horsepower and faster 0-60 to 60 acceleration times. That means that the payback period for this vehicle is 3.5 years versus that RX350. Now the same thing goes for the Audi Q5 hybrid. It is $3,000 less than this vehicle, but the RX is also much bigger. They're both just about as old, but this is also considerably more efficient, especially in city driving. Now the Q5 hybrid is one of the more efficient gasoline vehicles in this segment, so it will take you a little bit longer to pay off the difference between this RX and the Q5 hybrid. When it comes to the diesels, it's a very similar story. Mercedes-Benz GLK 250 Bluetech, that is the diesel model, is about $8,500 less than this vehicle. However, it doesn't get quite as good a fuel economy, and remember that diesel is more expensive than gasoline in the United States. We also get considerably more power in this vehicle than you get in that diesel GLK. Now the difference in operational cost is about $700, and that's before you factor in the fact that the GLK does require a urea injection system for emissions compliance, and you do have to add that cost of the fill-up to your long-term operating expenses. Compared to the Jeep Grand Cherokee Summit with the three-liter turbo diesel engine in it, the RX will cost you about $5,000 more to buy, but it will cost you $800 less a year to operate. Now things get a little bit trickier when you take a look at the BMW X3 28D. That X3 28D is actually $5,500 less expensive than the RX 450H, and it will also only cost you $200 more a year to operate. So that difference is an awful lot closer in terms of total operational cost. Now the X3 is obviously the more dynamic vehicle. It handles better, it also brakes better than the RX does. The RX does have more power and an awful lot more room on the inside, however. So if you're looking for the optimum in passenger and cargo room, then the RX would definitely beat that X3. When it comes to comparisons, the entry-level luxury options present an interesting balance to the RX. The Lincoln MKX is $9,700 less expensive than this, but it will cost you $1,950 more a year to operate because of its much lower fuel economy than this hybrid model. It's just about the same size as this vehicle, it's just about the same age as this vehicle also in general. I think that the Lincoln doesn't have quite as nice of an interior as the Lexus, but it is honestly very, very close. I think I prefer the style of the Lincoln, but the quality of the interior assembly in the Lexus. Now if you're paying attention to payback times, the payback time for the RX 450H over the MKX is about four and a half years or so. Now when it comes to the Cadillac SRX, the SRX is again similarly sized. I actually think that the interior of the Lexus RX is a little bit above that Cadillac SRX, both in assembly and in style. The SRX does give you a little bit more power than this, however it will cost you significantly more to operate. That's actually about $2,300 more than this because the fuel economy is lower than the Lincoln MKX. Now again talking about total cost of ownership, the RX 450 will be less expensive to own and operate and the break even point is 3.8 years. That means that if you're leasing the vehicle it may not matter too much to you, but if you're buying the vehicle, the RX 458 will definitely be less expensive to own. I've saved the trickiest comparison for last and that would be Lexus's own NX crossover. Now the NX is a little bit smaller than this, it's about the same size as the Audi Q5. However, the Audi Q5 and that Lexus NX are not that much smaller. It's more of a half step than a full step smaller. The NX is also very space efficient for a vehicle in that category. So in terms of interior room, we don't have that much less interior room than the Lexus RX. It is a little bit narrower, so you won't be able to fit child seats in the back quite as easily. But for the average accommodation on the interior, it's going to be very similar to the RX. Now the NX is going to be less expensive to buy and it also gets better fuel economy than the Lexus RX. That means that my bottom line in this segment would be the Lexus NX 300H over the Lexus RX 430H. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes and this has been the 2015 Lexus RX 450H hybrid crossover. Go ahead and click that subscribe banner at the bottom of your screen so you can be updated on all of my latest videos. You can also find me over at facebook.com slash alexnautos, over at twitter as alexnautos, and you can always email your questions to alex at alexnautos.com. I'll see you next week.